Hello. I, uh, yeah, yeah. that's your yeah. name. Squirrels got me. Big Jim. Yeah. <laughs> Cold and fun. That's good that you think of that of it because that's what deer hunting typically is, is cold and fun. Yeah. <laughs> Yesterday morning I'm blasting up on the pass and I see these deer moving. I'm like, ooh, there's some deer moving. All of a sudden I just see this person just head down, just hauling ass wearing shorts and a t-shirt with a pack on. And I'm like I'm like, is that hard? My dad always talks about floating through the woods like the autumn breeze. So so Robert's when you're the 275 pounds, I don't know how you do that, but the freightliner. It's just like a creeper. He's just kind of up in the corner watching what's going on there. Yeah. You know? He's like, <laughs> you know, he's up there slapping it, pissing all over everything. Is it warm yet? <laughs> How did you know the name of the actor? That's right. I know. How did you say his name? Her Herve Velichos. <laughs> <laughs> you know what Pertinier means? If you know what Pertinier means and you live in America, you're a redneck too. <laughs> Welcome to the Log Talk Podcast, brought to you by Pertinier Outdoors. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Pertinier Outdoors Podcast. This is your host, Billy, and we are on episode 160 this week. We've got, uh, I was a little excited to say his name at the beginning of the podcast, so it sounded like I don't know what, um, but I'm joined by my buddy, Cam Smith, who is a financial advisor with a firm here in the Rochester area, uh, under the parent company of Northwest Mutual. Um, been working with Cam for probably almost 12 years. I think he said he's been doing this for 12 years, and I was one of his first clients. Um, and something that I thought would be a val valuable conversation to bring to the audience. So hope you enjoy this chat. We kind of talk a little bit about the t the financial times of today and, uh, and also kind of some of the things that if you aren't doing uh, any financial planning, one of some of the benefits and some of the things to be thinking about as you start to pick someone to work with and uh, start to get yourself into this realm. So not something to be over, uh, to be nervous about. It's a, it's something good to have. It's feels good to have a plan. It feels good to be on a path. So um, enjoy this chat with Cam. A couple quick notes. The Beer event is quickly approaching us here, so a few weeks away, July 31st, uh, 1 p.m. to 5 at Windy Brew. We will be launching our uh, Feeding Them uh, Pilsner. We're pretty fired up about it. We got some awesome uh, stuff coming to the event. Uh, we've got, I guess, Ellicottville Distillery is going to be there to do a tasting. That's a, a new update to the event, uh, so they'll be there. The Hunt Works will be there with a bunch of product and some sales. Um, hunting western new york slash whitetail company will be there with their trailer so they'll have merch and things available there um then we have uh the deer association is going to be uh we're going to do a bunch of those game boards again so sean burdick will be there from the upper genesee chapter and we'll be doing a bunch of the game boards and having some opportunities to win some different guns um i'm probably going to buy another muzzle loader and do a raffle that way um and then, like last year, we had uh, one of the other raffles we did was we raffled off a New York State uh, youth uh, lifetime license. So it would be a $375 value as the, the youth license before they're four. So you could either use that on a youth or you could use it for yourself and put it towards, a, uh, put it towards your lifetime. So pretty good opportunity there. And uh, I'm sure we'll have some other stuff that will pop up. And the best way to stay in the loop about it is to watch our uh, the Facebook event that we have created for it. We'll be dropping updates in there of things that are coming along. And, oh, lastly, uh, Ben Ben Williams will be there with his uh, equipment to officially score deer. Ben is a certified scorer for the Northeast Big Buck Club, MBBC, and he uh, he will be there uh, like he was at Shed Fest scoring, but he will actually have his, his uh, official tape and and all the things that he needs to do that uh to actually put them in the book so if you were at shed fest and you brought sheds and you'd like to bring them back to have them scored if you have any deadheads if you have any bucks that are mounted that you would like to get uh, entered into the northeast big buck club great opportunity to do so and to show off your trophy so um more to come there but uh i think that's all i got on that end of things i hope you enjoy this week's conversation and uh till next time keep feeding them Cam Smith, welcome to the podcast. 
This is this Thanks is the for having me, man. Yeah, this is the first of the first of the Pert Near Financial Times podcast. <laughs> I've been wanting to do this for a while. I've I've been uh, as I've hinted, I'm very interested in all these different topics, not just hunting wise. And uh, you and I go way back. Uh, so I guess I don't want to introduce you. I want you to introduce yourself. Tell everybody how we know each other. Uh, man, uh, it goes way back. Uh, I don't know where where you want to start, but uh, high school. Bonfire Old friends. Into, <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're certainly more than bonfire friends. Uh, good old, uh, that was courtesy of Tom Lawrence. Yeah, that just, actually, that just hit me. Bonfire friends. We used to be arch enemies over a woman, and then it all, you know, then, uh, then we just came to terms with each other over a bonfire, and then here we are. What's that, yeah, 17, was, 18 years later? Yeah, and I, I don't think you got out of the lawn chair that night. I think you just you yeah. were just dedicated and committed. <laughs> yeah, was, literally didn't get out of the lawn chair. <laughs> <laughs> I almost became part of the bonfire that night, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I'd say that good old, good old HFL was kind of where this all started, so. And then uh, we rekindled our friendship, and and here we are. Yeah, it's um, so yeah, we went to high school together. You you graduated the same year as my brother and Chris. Um, so we all kind of ran in the same circles. We were all we were we were fairly good friends in high school. Um, but we got definitely got our relationship changed as we got out of high school, and we all kind of went our own ways during college. We kind of stayed in touch, saw each other during the summers, and uh, kind of right after you got out of college I think is that kind of when you uh got going down this path of getting into financial advising and that yeah so I did I did an internship um my junior year of college uh, at, a, at a at a smaller independent firm and um kind of went back my senior year of college with for the longest time I thought I wanted to be an accountant and it just wasn't uh I don't know. I just didn't enjoy the lack of interaction and, and forward dialogue. Um, you know, that it was kind of missing, you know, financial advising allowed me to talk, uh, talk with people about some personal things and, and, and again, look more forward than, than back. And, um, I, I ended up joining Northwestern mutual in 2011. Um, so this October we will, uh, we'll be going on 12 years, uh, here at Northwestern. It's pretty so, wild. It doesn't seem like that long. It, it doesn't, man. It, it goes by so fast. And, you know, we've obviously had some life events that have, have happened recently for me, as you know about, and it, it makes it go by that much faster, you know, to think that, uh, you know, we, we just had our first little girl, as, as you know, and uh, it's hard to believe that it's been four months already. It's nuts. It's wild. It really is wild. And, um, you know, that's where I think, so going back 12 years and I can remember – I almost remember where I was on the throughway when you, you know, you, you're getting started in this, in this world of financial advising. And, and at that point you're, you know, you're hungry, you need clients, you need people to work with. And, um, you know, in that same, in that vein, I'm a young guy, you know, you don't really have a lot of your future in your mind. You're just kind of wanting to take all the money you got and you want to buy a new car and you want to go do this and do that. And you think you're rich, but you really have nothing. Um, and I'll never forget the phone call that we had as I was driving on the thruway and, you know, you were really trying to get me to kind of trust you and jump on board to let you work with me to kind of start planning my retirement, my future. And, um, I can remember asking you some, something along the lines of, you know, are you, are you really going to keep doing this for a long period of time? Or is this just like, you know, use car salesman for a couple of years and then on to the next career. And, um, like that was a defining point really for me, you know, it is, you know, putting trust in someone to actually start looking at my financials and try to help me plan at the time for just myself. But now, you know, as you've evolved in your career and with my wife and I, you know, you're, you're helping guide us in our, you know, our investing and our financial future. So it's kind of, it's, it's been very interesting to, uh, take our friendship, you know, pre- this point and then take it into this whole new level of uh you know now we're we're partners in a way and that was the first topic i wanted to hit on uh that you know in the list of stuff i sent over to you is you know when you're we're in our mid-30s now i'm 34 going on 35 you're 33 um you know like 
if you're regardless of where you're at in in the stage, whether you are in your mid thirties or you're 18, 19 years old, getting ready to get out of high school and you know get into college or go into your first career or going to you know try to start making a living, like where do you start? That was the first question I want to hit you with is like where do you go to to figure out you know who's the right person to work with? Should I be financial planning? Should I not? You know what what should you be looking for in an individual like yourself? Yeah, I mean, I think probably the first place that that if I was, again, I, kind of in that seat where getting out of school or, you know, maybe maybe changing jobs and, and thinking about the future for the first time um, or even just getting closer to retirement, I might, you know, I'm probably going to start with asking my friends, right, get an idea of, of, you know, are they working with anyone? If so, who, what's their experience been? Um, you know, obviously, as you know with with growing your business uh it's all word of mouth right so um making sure that you know you're you're getting introductions to advisors uh and and those experiences have been positive um i think when you when you start the process even almost even before you you know maybe maybe touch with touch base with your friends around who they're using and such but i think you got to make like a conscious decision to want to change right so um like, like anything in life, you, you've, you've got to say, Hey, you know, I, I need to do something. I want to make a change. And then, you know, then you can seek out help. Mm -hmm. I think if you're, you're not in the right, right mindset to, to seek help, then, you know, it's going to be a waste of your time and certainly that advisor's time. So I think it's that internal switch that has to flip first, but, but once that switch is flipped again, kind of reaching out and, and maybe getting some introductions, but I think specifically what, uh, what you're looking for, um, is really an advisor, uh, that is putting emphasis on both accumulation planning, but also distribution planning, right? So, you know, really the accumulation phase, again, as you know, and you and I have talked about it is where you're at today, getting you to the point of maybe an event like sending your kids to college or, you know, making that transition into retirement. You know, you have those two reference points where you've just got to save money between now and then. And what's, what's the most efficient way to do it? What's the most tax conscious way to do it? Um, you know, what type of investment strategy should you be taking toward those, you know, those two reference points? Um, and obviously there's a, the financial planning gets far more uh, in, in my my phrase would be scientific, right? So when you've got all of these different pieces of the puzzle that you now have to start to unwind when you get to something like retirement, you want to make sure you've got an advisor that's versed in that, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and knows, you know, knows what they're doing. And, um, you know, you want an advisor that's credentialed, you know, maybe has some, some letters after their names um, or their name. And, uh, you know, the, the big one uh, is the certified financial planner. And then there's a bunch of other ones that are out there after that. Um, so the, again, all things that, that I would be thinking about. Um, I think it's helpful too, if you're finding an advisor that has a team, uh, just uh, again, for, for me, it's more, more peace of mind, you know, knowing that there's, there's someone there helping my advisor continue to deliver on the promises that were made to me. Right. Um, you know, it, less things to fall through the cracks, if you will. Yeah. And I'll, and I'll just speak for, for myself, you know, when it came down to me making that decision to work with you, you didn't have a bunch of letters after your name. You didn't have the reputation or the experience, but I looked at you as saying it's, you were somebody that I grew up with. You're somebody that I know where you live. I know your parents and, mm -hmm. and but I can know the character behind you. And I had trust that if you were going to do this and you're going to commit yourself to it, you're going to do it to the best of your abilities. And we were going to grow through this whole thing together. So that's really a big reason when I made that decision to really, you know, commit to working with you, it was because of all of those things that, you know, obviously we knew each other, but I knew that if you were going to do this, you were going to do it for, and you, you told me you're going to do this. This is what I want to do and let's grow together. You know, we're the same age. We're going to work through our lives, through the, the changes from having no kids to buying a house, to having kids, to, planning for college, like that's all stuff that you, you know, and there's a million of you out there, but, you know, find somebody who's, that'd be my advice to somebody is find someone who's in, in the same period of life as you are, that can understand and appreciate the challenges that you are facing, the things that you may be planning for, because I can sit down with you 
And it, it helps me now that you have a kid because I can sit down with you and be like, Cam, like, yes, I hear what you're saying, but it's not going to happen. <laughs> and now you're like, I get it, you know? And, I get it, yeah. But that, that helps. Like, that helps a lot because it's important to be doing these things. I, I firmly believe that. But uh, it's also important to be able to have that confidence to be straight up with who you're working with so I can tell you how I'm feeling and it's not a, you know, it's not, there's no like hidden ground there. So that's, uh, you know, I think based on what you just said and my advice there, that's, you know, what I would encourage people. If you're, if you're interested in getting into it, it is that, you know, ask your friends, ask your network. And if you have somebody that you can really connect with and feel like you're on the same path and the same journey together, I think that's invaluable. Yeah. So I would agree. And I, I mean, if you, if any human being has had enough interactions with humans, I think you can, you know, you'll have a good idea of who's genuine and who's not. Right. And I, I think that that can easily uh, be sifted through and you'll, you'll pick up on that. And then the only thing I would add is while I, I agree in regards to, you know, finding someone that's, that's going to grow with you, you know, our clients that we have that are, you know, a few years out from retirement or in retirement are actually coming to us because they are looking for, um, you know, someone that might be a little bit younger that's going to be able to see them through their entire retirement window, you know? Um, so I, I guess that's one of the things I would say probably over the last five, six years we've, we've seen more of is, uh, you know, just actually us getting seeked out because we are, you know, a little bit younger than, than some of these people. Interesting. Yeah. I hadn't thought about that. Um, so, so the, the next kind of the next rolling into kind of the next question I had, you know, for you to kind of give thoughts on is, you know, if you are, if you are someone at our age point getting started, what are a few things to be looking at doing, uh, investment wise, you know, I know what you and I are working on, but if you're, you have Billy walk in the room, we've never worked together. You're looking at my plans, you know, how does that all look, um, as you're getting started and what do you recommend? Yeah. So, uh, that, that's a tough one to answer because, again, a lot of that's going to be driven by input that you provide and, and just context around what it is that you want, right? So uh, my, my blanket advice would be for anyone that's, you know, kind of coming in and this is maybe the first conversation that they're engaging is, is to really start to have that advisor direct you down the road of a financial plan, right? Not, not just uh, pulling tools out of that advisor's toolbox and kind of saying, you know, Hey, Billy, here's a hammer when you actually need a wrench, right? So, so making sure that you're starting to formalize that, that plan. Um, now, I think your question might be more directed as to how do we, how do we implement that plan, right? Yeah, and, and so process. I think how do we, yeah, how do we, how do we make that plan um, have the highest success rate as possible? And I think a lot of that comes through um, automating as much as you can, right? Whether that's making sure you're getting the matching contribution on your 401k, or if that's you um, looking at after tax savings vehicles that come in, you know, right out of your checking account on a monthly basis, but, but make sure that you systematize it like everything else to increase your, your chances of success. Um, and again, what, what quote unquote tools are used are going to really going to be driven by what's important to you at that particular time that, you know, you're sitting down with that advisor. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And I, and kind of also what I'm, what I'm getting at with, I guess, asking this, you know, you talk about the process, but it's a, to me, it has been invaluable to sit down and have those long form nuanced discussions about what I want, what Sarah wants, what we are hoping to do with the kids. How do we want to help the kids plan for the financial future of them and having those discussions and then your ability to take those things and extrapolate them in a visual format so we can see what we need to do in order to achieve those sort of goals. Whereas, you know, you and I both know the first person I had experience with doing retirement planning, I, I think I was still in college. Um, but it was, it was someone offered through my employer, um, actually through Northwest mutual, you know, so that account was open up that way, but he, he, you know, I don't think he was being devious in what he was doing, but the, the package that was sold, not the package, but that, that item that was sold to me, that life insurance policy was not probably what it's not what you would have suggested to me at that time, but it was something that fit whatever he was looking at being an option for me. And 
in the long term probably wasn't the best option. It's not hurting me, but it's maybe not helping me as much as what I could have been doing with a different type of life insurance policy or something of that nature. So, like, I think that's that's a big piece to me is, you know, make sure that when you're sitting down to having these discussions that you're not just getting quickly sold on on a package of like, hey, here's the, the four things you should do, and once you do this, you're going to be golden. It's like it's just not that simple of a discussion, and, you know, you need to sit down and have those, you know, yearly updates, to, you know, to figure out are we on the right track, are we doing the right things, uh, that sort of stuff. Yeah, no, and I, I think that, again, kind of goes back to the whole financial plan, right, where I think advisors in our profession can be quick to throw out solutions with not fully assessing the situation, you know. Um, so I think it's, again, kind of sitting down, having that dialogue. And, and that takes time, right? You know, oh, gosh, that that took, um, you know, that took over a couple hours, you know, I mean, yep. just in, in sheer dialogue alone, you and I have, we've logged some time. So, you know, that's a commitment, but I think again, once that plan gets drawn out and everything is clearly articulated to you um, and it comes time to implement the plan, I think again, success is going to come through making it automated. And I think, um, you know, if we, if we looked at this at the core, a lot of it's going to come down to just cash flow management, right? So, so again, if you're that using your example of being that young young college student that's just getting out and getting their first job, you know, really making sure that they're managing their cash flow, um, you know, to allow them to save and do the things that they want. And and the same is true for retirees. You know, you're making this transition from working your whole life to now, you know, maybe living off of other avenues, social security investments, what have you. Cash flow management is going to be a key key part of that. So. Yeah, and budgeting is probably something that you see as a uh, is always. I'm sure you see all shapes and sizes of budgeting, right? You sit down to have that discussion with people, and you know, I know I have my method, and it's probably not the best, but it's something, and I've been doing the same thing for probably better part of ten years. Um, and it's you know, it's it work. It seems to work for me. You know, I have to constantly monitor it, and you know, it's kind of like rolling it over from month to month and keeping track of what my bills are. But I, I wonder, I mean, do you see a lot of people that have like literally no budget and they just are just living like day to day, week to week? Um, not, I would say probably not, not as much as I used to. Mm. Um, I would say early on, you know, as we're, as we're getting the, the, the firm going, that, that was the case. I think, um, I think people can get comfortable, right? Regardless of what your income level is, um, you know, you, you know what comes in. You, again, you you know maybe you don't know exactly what goes out because everything's automated. But um, but it is helpful regardless of where you fall and your your income to make sure that you at least touch you know touch base with that budget you know a couple times a year if not uh, if not more. So I'm just dropping in the. I see we got some people tuned in here live. So I was just dropping in there if anybody's got any questions on. Uh, topics of, of finance, feel free to either message or call in. Um, so yeah, so we're, what are some of the things that I'm just sitting here thinking about different things that have, that have been said to me that have kind of sunk in over time, uh, as like important things to, uh, to think about and, you know, just kind of like one, one that stuck with me and I don't know if it was you or if it was somebody else, but it was like, you want to have as you're planning, you want to have like multiple, you want to have a four legged like chair, you know, you want to have as many legs on your chair as possible. And the, the metaphor of that is that you don't want to have all of your money dumped into the stock market. You don't want to have all of your money dumped into an IRA. You want to kind of have yourself diversified. So you have, you know, stability and protection in many different ways from different things that can happen that are out of your control, out of our controls, you know, market situations like we're experiencing right now. Um, but that was one that stuck with me. And the other one was, you know, I'd rather, you know, somebody said to me, you know, you'd rather have that money come out of your paycheck and come out of your checking account as like a monthly bill and just get used to that. And once you get used to that is a part of your monthly expenses, you just kind of become comfortable with it. And that's something that both of those of those things we have done. And both of that, especially with me, the, you know, having that that just coming straight out of my checking account has been a huge deal for me. Because, I mean, 
it's just, you know, I just contact you and you call up and say, hey, how are things going, Billy? I'm like, you know what? I'm feeling good about things. I think we could throw another 25 bucks a month onto that IRA. And you just, you know, add that onto my monthly deduction and it just comes out of my checking account just like a normal bill. And that helps significantly, I think, in your, in your planning and staying on task with what you're trying to achieve financially if you just have those things set up and kind of just become used to how that feels when it is just coming out of your account or out of your monthly budget. Yeah. Again, I think the, the autumn being able to have everything happen automatically is going to increase your chances of success of whatever the goal may be, right? Whether again, saving for your next car, whether it's saving for retirement, the easier that you can make it, the, the higher the probability of you actually accomplishing that. So, and then I think, um, you know, to your, to your comment about the, the, the four legged stool, you know, and I, I think that is a philosophy that, uh, that I certainly embrace. I think, uh, you know, you're obviously articulating it as we, as we want to make sure that you've got options, right? So we don't want just all of your money funneled into one place, X, Y, and Z happens. And then there's going to be adverse effects from you going in and getting your money out of that one place. So we want to make sure that we're, um, you know, put money in different places for different reasons. Uh, but again, all of those different places would be in alignment with, uh, with the plan. So, So what the hell we got going on right now? So we're, we're looking at, at our, so, I mean, we're kind of, I mean, that's all high level and you really can't get too down in the weeds on this stuff because it's really not that entertaining to listen to. It's a, if it's something that's interesting to you and it's something that you want to go down the path of, which I recommend here, you know, th- these are the sort of things you should be thinking about, but you know, the, the main thing that you and I wanted to, that I wanted to talk to you about and kind of have a discussion is just where we are right now and where, where the economy is, you know, how things are looking. A lot of people, I'm sure, regardless of where you're at, whether you are close to retirement, like my dad and mom just retired last week in a pretty wild time. So they're thinking one thing, and then I'm sitting here with 25, 30 years left to work thinking of a little bit different of a thing. Um, so, like, what's your, what's your take? Like, how, how, are, how are things going across the, the financial spectrum? I mean, we know how it's hitting our – our inflationary pocketbook, but. Yeah. Um, that's a great question. And, and I think one of the, one of the things we've got to take a step back at and look at is, is obviously just the facts, right? The, the best, the best uh, indicator is what's happened in the past. So when we look at where we're at currently, we can define a bear market as a, as a decrease and of about, 20%, right? Some of the figures are loose, but, but call it 20%, right? So if the market drops down 20%, we've, we've now entered into a bear market. Between 10 and 19.99%, you know, that's more of more considered a pullback. And so when we go back to 1950, we've actually had 25 pullbacks, of which 11 have turned into to bear markets. So when we look at the average it's about three, every three years there's a pullback and about every seven years there's a bear market. Mm. Right. Um, so I think, you know, when we, when we start to frame it that way, it's, it's more of, okay, this is expected, right. It's, it's going to happen. Granted, we didn't necessarily know when it was going to happen, but you know, this is fairly normal when we, when we start to look at the, the averages of things. Um, and again, going back to what you were saying, while you might be sitting here thinking like, great, this is a good time for me to buy uh, into the market at a, at a 20% discount. Um, and, you, and your mom and dad, congratulations, by the way, they might be, you know, they might be a little bit more, more nervous, apprehensive as they make this transition. Um, it, it all comes back to focusing on the long game, right? So even for that person that's just entered retirement, they still have 30 years of, of life ahead of them where they're going to need this money to, to work for them. Um, so I think it's maintaining the focus on, on the long term, but having a good sound financial plan makes that a lot easier than kind of having those emotional uh, knee jerk reactions to the day to day stuff that you might see or hear, mm-hmm. you know, uh, throughout the week. But um so 
again, a lot of, I don't want to, I hope it doesn't seem like I'm sidestepping your question, but I want to make sure we're giving some context to some things that need to be done. And then we can talk about what's to come. Cause I think that's probably more of the, the, the underlying question of what's going on and what does this necessarily mean here for the, the weeks and months and years ahead. Right. Um, but I think, uh, again, once we put into context, what's going on, we have that financial plan. Part of that financial plan is going to be having, having a, allocation strategy that fits the plan, right? So, you know, using your example, you're, you know, 30 something years old, we've got plenty of time left. You might take more of an aggressive stance than, than someone that just entered retirement. But, but what does that actually mean? And it kind of goes back to that stool analogy in the sense that when you set up these investment accounts, you want to make sure that you're not putting all of your eggs in one basket. And there's certain parts of the market that you want to make sure that you're exposed to. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and through a properly diversified portfolio, you can actually reduce the amount of risk that you take in the account, right? So like when we look at the market right now, um, you know, as we sit here today, it's gosh, down 18, 19, per, the S&P 500, I should say, is what I'm referencing is down uh, 18, 19%, where a diversified portfolio might only be down 12 to 14%, right? And so that's the beauty of being able to have different pockets of money inside of that account. Some are doing better than others and it's able to collectively work together to limit that, that downward, uh, downward spiral there. So, um, so I think, uh, again, as we approach that diversification is really important in alignment with your financial plan, where we are right now and where we're going to go. Um, again, I don't have a crystal ball. I can only share with you, you know, some of the, some of the things that we're seeing, um, but I think that the biggest risk right now for anyone is making an emotional decision, right? Again, having that knee jerk reaction to get out of the market, um, or change their investment strategy drastically because of, you know, what's gone on over the last few weeks. Yeah. Um, you know, again, a plan should, should have addressed all of that. Um, but, um, what we're, so what we're starting to see is actually demand starting to, to fall a little bit in some areas, right? So you, you start to look at, um, what spending was like during COVID and I'd say 70% of spending was done on durable goods, you know, refrigerators, washers, dryer, car, you know, the whole nine yards. Um, whereas prior to COVID, most of our spending was on trips and travel and experiences and going out to eat, um, And we're at a point now where uh, things are starting to kind of revert back to that pre-pandemic normal, right? So like June, I think it was 25th, 26th, um, TSA had processed that weekend the most amount of travelers they had since the pandemic started. Hmm. Um, You know, our our dining, our going out to eat, you know, kind of the the money that's being spent at bars and restaurants, that's almost almost back to where it was pre-pandemic as well. Um, so we're starting to see spending kind of go back to the way that it was, which is, you know, start to lead, um, to inventories getting built back up, um, Walmart target, they've actually got a little bit too much inventory built up. So they're now starting to discount things. And right. yeah, you know, if you need deals on things, go to, go to their websites because they're clearancing a lot of stuff right now. Yeah. Yeah. They got They got to make room. They got to make room. So, um, So we're we're starting to see some of that. I mean, I think uh, obviously inflation, like you referenced earlier, um, you know, that that is and was a big thing. Um, What we're starting to see a little bit, too, again, is kind of this this buyer strike, if you will. Right. So, you know, whether you're looking to get a new house or a new car or you know whatever the case may be, you might not pull the trigger right now. You know, you might wait on it a little bit. Um, uh, You know, lumber talk about commodities for a second lumber's down 57 percent from its high oil's down 15 natural gas is down 37 so um so we're starting to see some some relief in sight um am i sitting here saying that i've got this figured out absolutely not um there's still some uncertainty right around what what exactly our energy price is going to do moving forward um but you know time time will tell so but, but we are expecting um, a, a little bit better half of 2022 than, than we did over the last half of the year. Hmm. Well, but I want to kind of dig into that a little bit. Um, 
Joe had a question that you were kind of tickling around there a little bit. Um, he was saying if you're aggressive in the stock market, uh, when should you be thinking about being less aggressive? So I think you, you were kind of answering that, but a lot of that depends on, you know, what's your end goal? Where are you at in that process? You know, are you trying to protect yourself or are you trying to take advantage of an opportunity to make money in a, in a situation like we're in right now or build your portfolio, you know, buy more stocks essentially at a lower price? You know, so if you're aggressive right now, you're getting more for less. And but if you're closer to the end of your working period or when you want to start drawing off of some of those accounts, you probably want to start pulling back on your aggressiveness a little bit, correct? To protect yourself. Am I understanding that how you would advise? Uh, yeah. So again, there's there's tough because I, I would I would have more questions to ask as to like what exactly does this? I don't know if you said Joe or Joel. Yeah, or, Joe. You know, yeah. What they have, what they have on their balance sheet. Um, but, uh, but I guess, yeah, I'll blanketly say as individuals move closer to retirement, they are scaling back the risk in their portfolio. How much, again, that, that varies by individual, but, but risk typically does get scaled back. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And like, you know, I know, I think Sarah, I mean, I think she just, cause she was very conservative, um, kind of middle of the, of the road on how she was had herself set up and I think she had made the change to have you go a little bit more aggressive on one of her accounts right now. Um, just because we have time and, and wants to, you know, see that aggressiveness try to pay off in this situation. But, um, so like, what are you like hearing that whole thing that fascinates me, like hearing the numbers and the percentages of, of what things are up and what things are down, um, you know, right now, mostly down, uh, in, in value, you know, you're saying like, you know, oil prices have dropped, um, energy prices have dropped. What else do you say? Lumber has dropped dramatically. But like what, like as you're looking at those things, like what are you, I guess, what are you looking at? Is that, is that the stock market numbers? Is that commodities? Like, are you watching that end of things? Like, how does that work in someone in your position? Like, what are you looking at? Yeah. So th those, I mean, I'd reference, those are obviously commodities, but, um, so I mean we're we're taking in as much uh, as much content as we can across all you know all the different platforms and um, you know a lot of these are looking at um, you know reports that come out every week you know not every week but some of them do some of them don't so it's just as as the information comes available we're sifting through that now we also have a team that's helping us sift through that so by no means uh, am I I sit in here day in day out just sifting through reports. Um, but, uh, you know, but that's all stuff that we're, we're keeping our finger on the pulse on. And, um, again, I still think it's, it's too early. So I, I know I give you maybe some, some facts that are more silver lining. I, I still think it's too early to say if we are going to have a recession, right? Cause that, that over the last few weeks, that's been the, that's been the talking point, you know, one week it's inflation the next week it's, oh my gosh, we're going to, we're, we're going to recession. recession, right? Um, is the recession already and, here? Are we, are they yeah, just not announcing yeah. it? You know, like that's something that's fascinating to me is like, well, how do you know? Like, does, does somebody in the federal government or the, the head of the fed have to come out and say, well, we're in a recession or is, or are the actions being taken and the things that are being seen already showing that we're in it? Like that's all really, really interesting to me. Yeah. And, and so there's certainly measurables, right? And that's where I think, like when I, I, I mentioned earlier about, you know, what defines a bear market and what, what defines a pullback, I think that's really important information, obviously, just because it does lend some context to, to what's going on. Um, but, uh, but again, should, let's say that, let's say that uh, we do continue to, to trend where things are um, tight, stressful, you know, and we, and we push toward a recession, we're, we're hopeful that, uh, that it's going to be mild and, and what can help us determine that is really just the strength of the, the individuals. So we, as the U S consumers and, and corporations, right? So when you look at, um, uh, from, from the start of COVID till now, like credit card debts are down about $86 billion. Um, as of March 31st, there's about $4.1 trillion that, that we have in the U S and checkable deposits, right. Kind of just sitting in CDs and such, uh, which is the most that it's been in a long time. So you're saying um, that credit card debt has, has done, has gone up or it's gone down. 
has gone down. Okay. Has gone down about $86 billion since the start of COVID. So, hmm. um, you know, we're starting to see some, some signs that, you know, cons- consumers and uh, again, uh, corporations are, are in a place, um, you know, that, that would allow them to maybe weather a recession a little bit quicker than like 2007, 2008, right. That's yeah. the, the closest one that, uh, you and I probably resonate with. So, um, Again, all of the, I, I say all of this to, to hopefully just, I'm probably sound like a broken record, that um, it all comes back to the plan, you know, and it comes back to having a plan that takes into account your investment and your investment strategy. So, you know, whether the market goes up or down tomorrow, that shouldn't drastically impact how you're living your life or how you're living retirement or how you're saving for your kid's college. Yeah. Yeah, state of the plan. It, it's dude. It's so hard to not get emotional in in this day and age. I mean, you and I, we have all sorts of candid conversations. And wow, Ralph, just yeah. uh, stretch right out there, bud. Um, <laughs> it, it's it's hard to it's hard to keep it on the rails. You know, as far I, where I'm at, we've got time, so I'm not like freaking out about doing anything dramatic with my physical investments. But like, you start to f- feel the pinch and. I mean, I'm extremely fortunate for the for the career I have, the job I have, the income I have, my my wife's job and income. Like we're comfortable, but I can only imagine, you know, if if I wasn't in this situation, you know, and I didn't have the income that I have, like how much of a stress there would be on our household right now with the increase in, in just the day to day living costs. And you know, I I feel for for people that are in that situation, and you know, I'm. I'm, you know, I'm more on the edge right now than I have been in 10 years because my income is based on delivering and selling vehicles and vehicles are not being built and not being delivered. So like in a, in a way I'm feeling that pinch a little bit, but it's definitely, uh, you know, that, that's the thing that's fascinating to me is like, how long is this going to go on for? Is this just the new standard of living and how much we've seen it go just like up and down, like it seemed like it was just six months ago, there was this big labor push where all, you know, it was like, oh, like, you know, companies are starting to give their people raises and are getting more money. And then it's like, oh, but inflation now, like we've got fuel prices that are up, you know, what, 40% over what they were a year and a half ago, you know, we're paying double what we were at the pump and, you know, your food's more expensive and everything else is going along with that. And I think it, that's the scary part for me is if people didn't get started financial planning and getting themselves started you know like this is a kind of a daunting time to get on that path you know what i mean oh absolutely and i i couldn't agree with you more and i certainly feel the same sentiment that you do and and again with all that that's going on um and i think so what i would say to that person is that the steps that they make toward financial planning and um you know getting on some form of plan might be a little bit smaller, right? You know, I think you have to be realistic with what can we do given the times, um, but obviously then scale that up as you can, right? And I think that, that that's where having someone in your corner to do that and help you with that makes it a lot less stressful than trying to trying to go at it on your own. Yeah, yeah, if you're trying to, trying to tackle all this by yourself, it's – you know, and if you're just sitting at home in your basement trying to trade Bitcoin so that you can retire someday, <laughs> like that's got to be a, that's got to be a dark place to be, man. Yeah. So. I mean, what what are you? I don't know. No, 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 you go. I was gonna say I don't I don't know if that gave you the clarity though that you may have been looking for. I don't know where I was going to qu- be quite honest. I was just saying a whole bunch of words because I okay. I, I just I look at where we're at today and like. I'm so grateful that I have the base and the plan started that I have because if I was in the situation today where I didn't have that and now I've got two kids at home, it's like, where the hell do I get started? And do I want even to get started? Do I trust to put my money into a, a, a the stock market or put it into an IRA? Do I even trust that? Like that's where I am today, like I'm feeling those things today and I'm already doing that other stuff. I'm not going to change what I'm doing, but I'm having those internal questions and my wife and I are having those discussions of like, you and I have talked about it. How much money do I continue to put into a savings account? When do I 
how much do I put in there? When do I max that? Like, when am I, is that the max amount that I put into that savings account? So like, we'll just use me for an example in, in the last discussion that we had was, you know, I've, I had a, do, a dollar amount two years ago that I, that I wanted to target to get into my savings account where I was comfortable, had, you know, half a year to a year's worth of income or not income, but bills covered. So God forbid something was to happen. I was protected. Right. And I've gotten there. I'm beyond that point a little bit and anticipating my deliveries that are coming. I, I know I'm going to have the ability to have more cash that I could put to that account. But the question, the discussion that you and I had is like, should I continue to put more money in just a basic savings account and let it sit there and essentially do nothing for me? Should I pull cash out? So I have cash on hand somewhere you know, buried in some deep hole out in uh, the backwoods somewhere, or should I be putting it into an investment account? And that's, you know, there's a, I think there's a mix there, but that's kind of something that I think would be valuable to talk about is because I think that's a situation that a lot of people are staring at because we hear all the things that we hear in the news and, you know, your, you know, your money's in a bank. And if, if something happens with the banking system and it goes down, then you don't have any money because all your money's tied up in some bank account somewhere. That's a thought that goes through my head, and I'm sure I'm not the only person out there who's thinking about it. Um, so, what do you do? I mean, what's your what's your advice on how much is how much is enough, and and then what are some of your options to do with it if you don't want it to just sit there in a savings account? Yeah, again, I, so I think everything's scalable, right? And it's all relative. Um, you know, the dollar amounts might change from individual to individual, but I, I certainly think that there needs to be an emergency fund. Um, of just money that you can get your hands on. Now, whether that's in a, a savings account, checking account, or if that's in a, a CD, or if it's, you know, buried in your backyard, right? There, there's a number that's associated that you're trying to target so that if something does happen, you have the means to, to weather that storm. I think once that number is determined and you've accomplished that number, then, you know, then a few more doors open. Uh, which door you walk through is going to be contingent on what's what's the priority for you right if it's saving more money for retirement or if it's saving for a next house where you put that you know where you put that it's probably going to change yeah um but uh you know but there's there's certainly option there's you know there's mutual fund accounts there's roth iras there's iras there's putting more money in your plan through work um you know there's there's things out there but again it kind of all comes back to what's that next step after you've reached that cash number that you're looking to get? Um, you know, again, I'm uh, by no means am I opposed to you having cash on hand too, right? Putting it in the safe under the mattress, wherever you want it. But I think there's a point where uh, it can become too much, right? That's, that's liquid and not in doing something somewhere. Well, the, well <clears throat> so that, but also, gosh, you know, if you called me Billy and said, I've got, you know, I've got 15 grand that's just floating under my mattress, what what happens if your house catches on fire tomorrow you know what i mean so right. i think i think there certainly is a balance uh, of how much do you actually keep cash and how much do you actually put it into an institution and then how much do you actually invest yeah and do you have any recommendations on what to put your money in if you're going to bury it in your yard do you have any <laughs> <laughs> I've, got, I've got nothing man i've got nothing ziploc bags <laughs> vacuum seal yeah um fireproof safe what do you recommend run it through that venison food saver you know there you go i like it just don't put any meat in the bag with it that would that would be not good that would not be good i don't know i mean these are these are the things that i think about because i i feel like um in this day and age i have we've all become so reliant on that plastic card you know like if like for 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 the most part and most people don't carry any cash. It's kind of an old school thing if you're going to carry cash. And I know a lot of places are not really prefer not to take cash anymore. They'd rather have you use a card. But I've kind of been enjoying lately, you know, using cash to just pay for things. It's a pretty, it's a, it's kind of a freeing feeling knowing that's like, yeah, I just bought that. But like, I don't have to worry about paying that later on a credit card or it didn't just come out of my checking account. Like it's physical in your hand. You're paying for it. Um, I think there's something to be said for that, uh, and and I definitely think that there's value in having some of that stuff uh, free and in hand, so when you need it, it's there. 
Absolutely. And I think, I think uh, those cards, like from a financial plan perspective, those cards, whether it be a debit card or a credit card, I mean, they can, they can make spending money almost too easy, right? So if you're walking around, you've got 50 bucks for the week, or whatever the number is, um, you know, once that 50 bucks is gone, you know, it's gone. Right. So, um, so yeah. Yeah, it's gotten to the point where you can literally just hold your card in front of the damn thing and you can just, you're buying stuff. Or you're on your phone and you're just swiping and you're like, well, I just, yeah. just spent $1,000 on camouflage. Well, there you go. That's Man, another thing that I like about you, Cam, and that's been fun to evolve with our friendship is that you've evolved into a more of a hunter. You were always a fisherman and an avid one, but now you've caught the bug with the hunting so you understand the problem that it is of like, oh, I really want that camo jacket or that new set of arrows next thing you know your your, your budget isn't looking so good because you got to do these things <laughs> yeah man I, I i mean i grew up spent a lot of money on fish and stuff and i i started deer hunting in high school but uh but just recently i got the the itch to to jump into archery and um i'll be going on my second year so um yeah last year i had to spend a little bit more money on some archery stuff than uh, than i have in years past <laughs> yeah so. it's not hard at all and that's the struggle of a anybody it doesn't matter what if it's golf or it's you know hunting or whatever but you know when you get into these these things where there's you need more items to go do this stuff you know you don't have to have a lot of these things but it's nice to have them and it costs money so you gotta nope. buy say buy trade and sell that's what i've the last couple of years that's what i've been doing is you know i've accumulated enough stuff that there's value to it. And if you buy nice things, they, they somewhat hold their value and you can, you know, sell them off and then go buy new things and try out new stuff. So, um, that's part of the financial plan, you know, staying on yep. track, getting, getting that new origin camo. <sighs> I'm, I'm fired up for that origin camo. I I'm trying to sell my four low stuff, but nobody's buying. If anybody's in the market, I got some hundred percent American made four low gear, nothing wrong with it. I got no problems. It performed great for me last year really did all the way from Colorado down to the the cold wet days in Pennsylvania in the mountains it, it stuff's great but I really want to try I really enjoyed kind of trying out different things and um, supporting American-made companies is kind of my my thing of late so if anybody's interested I've got some some pants and a puffy jacket and a and a soft shell jacket that have got your name on it just reach out to me you know but you're you're a little too thick now Cam I couldn't couldn't squeeze you into those 34 pants. You'd be blowing out of those things. Those yeah, that's going to be changing here, man. Once we uh, once we get back into having, a, you know, the normal cycle, having a kid throws everything off. So Sure does. It sounds like an excuse, though, because I've been through it and I haven't gained a pound. So just saying. <sighs> yeah, I, see, that's a fair point. Well, fair the, point. the worst part is, is is riding the desk all day. That's That's what freaking kills you, man. Yeah. It's, it is, uh, it does. So we, we compensate, man. We try to try to get out as much as we can, but yeah, sitting here all day long certainly doesn't help. No, you got that drawer. I know you got that drawer to your right that you got a bag of Cheez-Its in or something and you're just whomping on those things all day. Dude, what is actually, it? I, I just got some mountain op stuff. I mean, shameless plug for mountain ops, but, oh. uh, Oh, Blaze, nice, some fat burner so you can sit there and just, you get all flush and red because your blood pressure is blowing through the roof, <laughs> just burning calories. I've used that stuff before. That stuff will get you fired up. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah, especially on those days where you get, like, two hours of sleep, man, popping pop two of those, like, I'm good. I'm yeah, good. I, I ran on that, on that and Ignite um, for probably the first two years of, of Billy's life. I was just a freaking caffeine addict, and, uh, it gets you through some things, you know. I'm not saying I'm proud of it, but um, I'll never forget <laughs> one. It's not a long term, not a long term solution. By no, any means. no, no. It's a short term survival. I've said to many people that being a parent, especially of, of infants and uh, and what do they call them, uh, toddlers, it's survival. You know, it's just like just make sure there's some calories in their body and that you're not going to die, and uh, and that everybody comes out the other side of five years old and um, everything will be all right. So you you know you're you're like seven months in, and you're you're doing great. Not even seven. You're like four or five months in, right? Yeah. Four months. No. Yeah. You don't even know yet. Wait till that kid starts moving. You'll be screwed. <laughs> Eric. Oh man. Eric chimed in and said he loves. What's your What's your favorite topic, Eric? Is it the the dad talk or is it financial talk? 
I'm here to prove it's a long-term solution. What what's a long-term solution? Eric's like a super fan, so he's going to he's probably going to freaking Marco Polo me with a 15-minute video and oh, he loves both topics. He just loves just real talk. Just being real AF right here. <laughs> real uh BC, real BC is what we're doing. Um let's see what else are we talking about? This got derailed. That's why we shouldn't allow people to comment and get involved because I lose, I see a squirrel and run off. Oh, pre-workout solution for all parents. Yeah. So I, here's a funny story for you. I I did uh, before the pandemic when you could actually like do things in like close proximity with people. We were doing uh, at the gym in town. I was doing, uh, there was, they would do class. They do classes every morning at 5 a.m. And uh, my buddy Scott and I started doing uh, kickboxing, which is hilarious because I've never done any, like, no, like, fighting or punching or kicking. I, and I am a gangly, like Brian calls me, I'm I'm a big bird looking son of a gun. And uh, so I'm out there, we're freaking swinging, I'm kicking, swinging, you know. And uh, I had taken, I don't know if it was, I want to say it was Blaze. It wasn't, I don't think it was Ignite. I think I took I took two blaze pills that morning just to get fired up to go to the gym and my heart rate got so high. I was so <laughs> maxed out. <laughs> I almost passed out when I was, when I was doing, I don't know if I was holding the bag or if I was doing the punching and kicking, but it was bad. Like I almost redlined right there. And I, I think that was the last time I took the stuff because I was like, this is not good for me or my heart. Um, and then I kind of backed it off a little bit, you know, but you got to test those boundaries, Cam. Yeah, I think everything's good in moderation. Moderation <laughs> is the key. Moderation is the key. So what else? Do, do we, was there anything else you wanted to uh, – well, I got – so that – and there was one question. The last question was – so we're so we're in this situation right now. We've got – we kind of covered, you know, where, where the economy – not necessarily the economy, where finances are at, you know, if you're looking at your end of things. Um, what, what should – I've got – money right now like what should i be if i wanted to invest in things like i don't this probably isn't you directly in your ballpark but it's probably something you have opinions on you know are you better off investing in like tangible things like land or houses or property um or equipment something that has tangible value that like if things go sideways you have something that has value that kind of protects you or are you better off holding on to that money and putting it in some sort of an investment account or having that that nut of cash set aside so that you have that? Like, what's your kind of opinion on it? Because that's something I'm battling with right now is that I don't really need to buy um, – I don't really need to buy land. I have land in both my in-laws and my parents have property – I don't need to buy land, but like I have this like this like this urge that I need to invest in something. And you and I have talked about this, but like, what are your thoughts on on all of that? Because I think there's a lot of thirty something year olds that are in that period of their life right now where it's like, this is kind of a time when I want to invest my my money into something that I can have for the rest of my life and then potentially pass down to my kids and grandkids. Yeah. Um again, a lot to unpack because a lot of it is, is I think extremely situational uh, in, in how you approach it. Right. So in the, in the case that it's extremely important for you to be able to acquire property, find fulfillment on that property, whether it be through hunting, spending time with your kids or whatever, and then ultimately passing that property on to them. Um, I would say that that fits part of your financial plan, right? If that is, again, truly something that's that important to you to acquire that property, I think is a piece of the puzzle, right? Um, if you're just saying, hey, you know, I'm going to buy this property and flip it if, you know, it, if I can, and if the market allows in a couple of years, right? I think that's a different perspective to look at it. Um, again, I think it all comes back to what do you want? Like, I know we have a mutual friend that, uh, that does real estate and that started as something I think, uh, and I'm probably speaking for him and I'll hear about it if I'm wrong, but that was something that started, um, you know, on the side and eventually it became a passion of his where he fully committed it to it. Right. right, and, right. and that is what he's doing. Uh, and that is part of his plan now moving forward. So I think it's, 
it's just the perspective in, in what do you want that to, to do for you? You know, is it a quick buck or is it something that's more than that? You know? Yeah. And that like something that, that I romanticize over, especially I, f- I find myself always doing it like around when I'm on vacation because we have started to basically our, our vacations we're, we're, we're finding an Airbnb somewhere and we're staying in someone else's property. Um, and I've, I've, I've like, we were at the lake last week at Chautauqua Lake, uh, in a, in a nice lake house. And I'm sitting here just thinking like, like what a, what a cool thing to own a, own a lake house, own a cabin, own a house somewhere, whatever. But for me, it'd be owning a lake house. We love the lake. Our family loves the water. I love being out fishing, boating, skiing, yada, yada. You know, having that, that's yours. You own it. You're, you're building equity in it. Um, but you're also, it's an investment where you are renting it out and you're making money off of your investment. And like that, that thing right there is something that's fascinating to me. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of unique ways and unique opportunities to make money doing that sort of stuff that I think things are continuing to just evolve in that space where, you know, even property that we currently own, you know, like my dad and I have talked about it, you know, our hunting camp, it's an incredibly unique cabin that gets used three months out of the year. Is there value there that, you know, other people would see and they would pay to utilize that and experience that cabin life? I mean, you go on Airbnb and look and they're all over the place. People renting cabins, renting, there's people that are taking sheds and putting them on a back 40 and beautifying the shed and getting 300 bucks a night for the damn shed. You know, like, so like there's a lot of really unique ways that you could take money that you have that maybe you don't want to put into an investment account and you don't want to do that, but you could put it towards something physical that could turn into an investment for you where you're making money off of it. And I don't know if you have anything in response to that, but that's, those are some of the things that are like going through my head of stuff that you could do, you know, with your money. So it's working for you. Yeah, no, yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, uh, my wife and I, I think I, I had mentioned to you, we bought some property in the Thousand Islands actually solely just to give us access to hunt ducks. Um, but again, we've kicked around. Do we, you know, put a tiny home on it and rent it out on Airbnb, you know? Um, but again, I, I think the, the key is I, I, I bought the property to hunt ducks, right? Cause that's, that's a passion. Mm-hmm. Um, if we can make money off of that, great. So I think it kind of comes back to really what's the, what's the purpose of the property? Is it, you know, to again, rent it out and make money or is it something more than that? Um, but I'm certainly not against tangibles if it, you know, if it fits kind of what that individual's looking to do and what they want to accomplish. Yeah. Thanks for just dodging all my questions. You're just such a typical freaking financial advisor, business person. Oh, you know, well, just, you know, say a bunch of things. I'm just fucking with you. <laughs> Dude, uh, if, if it was you and I, we didn't have an audience, I could be far more structured. Why, but I guess Why can't you just say it? Just say it, Cam. But to, but to give but to give blank advice in my opinion doesn't make sense. No, right? but so what but I like not your about. not your opinion, but your person. Like you you already just said it. You know, you bought a piece of property. It's your that that's your passion. You love you love duck hunting. You love fishing. You love the islands. You know, your wife's from up that way. Um, you spent a lot of time up there. Your family has a cottage up in up in the Thousand Islands. So like that was something to you guys, you and your wife, that you found that it was of value to you to do it. And I think that's one of the things in our in our generation that I find that we kind of have a very hard time and I'm generalizing, but this is just my feeling on it. I don't see a lot of people of our generation, the 30 year olds right now going out and buying property. A lot of the property that we all have access to is generational property is our fathers or is our grandfathers. It's been passed down throughout the family. We're in this like weird, weird stage right now. I don't think it's a coincidence. I think that's why we're seeing a lot of the weird stuff going on in our country and in across the globe is that we have all of those boomers that did so much. They picked up so much of the slack of things in the 60s and 70s, and then now they're all retiring. And then here's all of us 30-year-old millennials, whatever you want to call us, and we're all like, well, we've never had to like be responsible for anything. So now we've got all these these like – We've never been there. We haven't done it. So, like, I think we're it's it's something that's incredibly intriguing to me because I look at my dad and his brother when they bought our family property. They didn't have money. They were they scratched, borrowed, steal. They freaking 
they just figured it out. Like, I don't need, I, I would love to have that discussion with dad to just understand how they did it to even just come up with the cash to buy the property. And then they had to pay other people back for the cash they borrowed. Like our, I feel like our generation's mindset is not that way. It's like, we feel like we need to have enough cash or enough like equity and something else to pull that money out, to dump it into an investment. So we're not like burdened to someone else. I mean, I'm pretty sure my dad, my uncle had, they had all sorts of IOUs to all sorts of people just so that they could buy the property that they had, that they had to pay it back. And then they scratched and clawed and did firewood for 25 years to pay for that property. So it's like this unique thing that I, I think we're our generation. I'm saying a whole lot of words right here, but I like, do you agree? Like, it seems like it's something that our generation really hasn't done a lot of. Cause I don't feel like I see and hear a lot of it. I mean, I know we've got friends like, like Chris who are doing the, all this, but it's not, it's, there's a lot of, a lot of us are just kind of like, well, we don't own property. So we got to hunt public land or we got to get access to somebody else. We're not necessarily thinking about like, well, I could be a landowner too, or I could buy a cabin or a cottage. Yeah, no, I think I, w- I would say of the, of the people our age that I'm talking to, it is not coming up at all, you know, that they have property of their own. You know, so I think you hit the nail on the head. Most of the most of the property is that generational property. So that's it. Oh, I, I guess that <laughs> what, what you, said, you you said you were saying a lot of stuff, and you I were. Did. I did. Say I mean, a lot of stuff. I I have a similar story. I mean, the the cottage that you've seen that my parents bought when they first bought it, uh, they took out an IOU and collateral was their 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 yellow and black lab. <laughs> Really? Collateral. Yeah. Cause they had my, so my parents had gotten those dogs for each other as wedding gifts. And my dad spent a ton of time training them and they were like perfect dogs. And, uh, that was the collateral oh, know, shit. On, on a private, on a private loan. So, so no, I mean, uh, we have that, we have that in our family as well. And, um, you know, I think there's probably, so what I heard you say, and I'm, again, I'm, I'm, trying to bring this back to finances, I think there's certainly a balance of planning, but also living for today, right? So the enjoyment of you mm-hmm. and, and your your dad and your uncle being able to use that property is probably can't put a price on it, you know? Yeah. Um, but I also don't think that you should go completely broke trying to cash flow a property that you can only hunt deer on for a few months. You know? <laughs> right. No, but I think, I think you just nailed it um, in a way is that, I think our generation has been so just pounded on that you have to have a plan. What's your goals? How are you going to get to be, you know, the CEO or the what, you know, like what's your financial plan? What's your budget? I, if you went back and talked to my parents in their 20s and 30s, they weren't doing anything. They weren't financial planning. They weren't, you know, that's a pretty bold statement. I, I don't want to mom and dad have done very well for themselves, but from my understanding, they really didn't start doing a whole lot until they were in their late thirties and 40 to really start planning for retirement. And granted they had, you know, dad was already in the state retirement system and mom, you know, was just getting going working for the school, but it just, I don't think it was that top priority. I think there was that, that spur of the moment living the life like, Oh, I want this thing or, Oh, I want to go do this or I'm passionate about that. Like, I think it was it was just a different time. Whereas with this, we, our generation, we just seem to like hem and haw a lot over things because it might differentiate from the plan. Or is this is this something we're supposed to do or okay to do? I'm not seeing a lot of other people doing it. Um, but I I think we're in a very kind of rounding out this whatever the hell this statement is. is I think there's going to be a ton of opportunity in the next five to ten years as we come out of this last two years and hopefully things in this country get themselves back on track and we can start worrying about ourselves and each other and stop worrying about all the BS that goes on um, and all the different social groups and, you know, this and that. I think we, once we get away from that, I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity for people of our generation to become the landowners, to become the property owners and the, the owners of cottages. And, you know, you go around and see these, there are going to be hard financial times over the next few years for a lot of people. And there will be opportunity for people to capitalize on some of those, some of those things. If you have prepared yourself or you can start preparing yourself for those things. So you're not caught flat footed 
and you can kind of be leaning forward so you're ready when that opportunity is available to buy that 50 acres down the road or, you know, buy that farm you've always wanted to buy. Like you, you, you may have those opportunities if you plan for it. But if all of a sudden it, it presents itself and you weren't thinking at all about what I need to do to do that, then you're probably not going to be able to make any of those things happen. So. Yeah. I mean, and, and honestly, it just starts with a conversation, you know, with, with someone. And then, uh, as my, my good friend Jocko says, discipline equals freedom, right? So if, yeah. if in the plan, it's important for you to acquire something, whether you use it to generate income or you use it for personal pleasure, you know, identify that, figure out how to get it and then stick to the plan and have the discipline to see it through. Yeah. God, we so. need like, and we need so much more of that. Like I, I see so many of the problems and I hear so many of the things and so much of it comes back to that. And is, does, you know, people like Jocko and, you know, we had the 4th of July weekend and, you know, I, f- I found it interesting. I know you and I um, circulate a lot of the same podcasts and listen to a lot of the same people. Um, and that's why a lot of or why we're like-minded and what we think and what we do. But, you know, like somebody like Jocko, I mean, God, I just hope that like guys like that just stay around and continue to be influencers in our culture and help kind of, you know, formulate the direction of, of our generation as we move forward and work through these, these changes in these times, because he's just, God, like we just need more discipline in this country. And I think that so many things would straighten themselves out because everybody is just so worried about everybody else and what everybody else is doing and not focused on themselves and at home. And that's where it all starts, man. Like if, if your house isn't buttoned up and your relationship isn't tight, with your, with your wife and your kids and you're not doing what you need to at home, chances are you're going to go to work and you're going to be a complete disaster and you're not going to hold up the end of the bargain to your coworkers and that's not going to help you move forward in your career and it just all trickles downhill, you know. And I don't know. It's, I mean, this is, a, this is a, a life discussion here, but, I mean, if it, wasn't for, if it wasn't for my family and my friends over the last couple of years, like, I don't know, I'm not not to be like melodramatic, but like it keeps you focused, it keeps you grounded on what you're on what's important in life. And I feel really bad for people that don't have that or aren't able to achieve that because I think a lot of it just all starts within and starts with your individual self, you know, committing to something and working hard at it and being true to yourself and your family and, and all of it. I think it just helps you stay the path and we just need more of it. And that's why I, I value the hell out of people like you because, you know, we can have these long discussions and I call you while I'm driving on the road and we'll shoot the breeze. And, and like, you know, I came in there a month or two ago and we sat down and we, we did. We talked for like two and a half hours. And if there was a portion of it that was you needing to get updates and information from me. But a lot of it's just life. And it's, you know, surrounding yourself with people that are driven and motivated to achieve these these great things in their lives and not just to achieve great things, but to be a good person to your, to your community and to yourself and your family. And like, then you can go to bed at night and sleep good and get up and get after it again. And I mean, that's what Pert Near Outdoors is kind of been for me. It's, I don't need, I don't need that additional group of people because I feel so fortunate to have the people around me that I do. But if I can help expand that group to people all over, the world for that matter. But, you know, we kind of have our little community here in Western New York and upstate and Pennsylvania. Like we've, you just generate friends and everybody keeps each other on track and, you know, you see somebody having a bad day or, you know, they need to talk, they can reach out to you and you can be a, be a human and be a person. And that's so much of this too, right? Is just being, just being somebody, somebody could talk to. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, that was very Joe Rogan ask of. I don't know what but, uh, I don't know what's into me right now. I I'm tired or something. I don't know, but I, it's how I feel. I listen to this stuff all day, man, and it's like, God, like we can, you know, like for you and I talk about Frisella all the time, and I just I'm not gonna go, you know, Andy on you, but at the end of the day, it all starts with us, like the individual. If you are not focused on yourself and the perfection of yourself, or the excellence of yourself. What are you, what are you, you, you are, what are we doing? Yeah. Was it green or growing and, or ripe and rotten? You know, I agree. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, uh, the, the common denominator of all the, all the bad things today 
and what's going on, you turn the news on, all those things, every one of those individuals has got, they're lost. They have no direction. They have no purpose. They don't have a career. They don't have, and I feel for them. Like, I don't, I don't know what I could do to help those individuals because you have to want to be helped, but you also, there's like a direct correlation between having something that you're passionate about. For us, it's hunting. It's the outdoors. Like, if I didn't have hunting in the outdoors, I'm sure it'd be something else. But it's like, it's a direct correlation. If somebody's depressed, they probably don't have a hobby. They probably don't get out of the house. They're probably just stuck in a rut, and you're depressed. It's nature. It's just the way it works. But, you know, <laughs> what am I supposed to say? I don't know where, I don't know where to go. <laughs> I don't know, man. You're on a heater. You never walk away when you're on a heater. No, I never walk away when I'm on a heater. So what, what I would do if we were to do this, like, like real AF is that you would try to start to make a point and then I would start screaming over you and <laughs> say, doesn't that make you pissed off? <laughs> I listen to I'm like, let freaking DJ finish a thought. You know, it's like every time it's, you can almost plan it now. I wonder if they, pl- if they like plan that because like DJ will try to start to say something and Andy will just steamroll right over. Him. And it's like, <laughs> Andy, we know, like we know you're fired up. We've known that for 48 minutes, you know? Yeah. But I don't know. This is a good chat, and I hope that people take value from it. And if anybody you know wants to talk with you, I'll you know put your um, I don't know. I'll put your email in the bio or something uh, to this. So if people want to reach out, they could shoot you an email and uh, connect that way. Or is there another way you'd prefer for them to do that? Or no, that's that's fine. And again, and I I know I know you called me out on on. <laughs> fairly blanket generic advice but i mean again there's there's so many different variables that come into play for everyone in their situation to try to make it super specific is pert near impossible pert near and and i was i was pert near being a being a a bonfire friend and giving you a hard time is what i was doing you knew that no, um, I do. I do. but the you know it's uh it's good stuff and i, I should have just stopped talking there because you just you just ended it in a perfect way, and then I just have to keep talking. But you know, so I do. Of course, I do appreciate Joe and Eric tuning in, and um, I know I see there's a few other people there. But appreciate you guys tuning in. Hope you uh, enjoyed the chat. And uh, if you ever have any questions, if you want to talk further on this, Cam is a, a great one to do so with. And uh, I've got several. Actually, I have, I have you, I have Connor, I have Jeff, and I have uh, my cousin David are all financial you know, whether it's, they all have their kind of specialties, but they're all into finance and planning. So, um, there's a lot of people out there that do it. And, um, if you want help, just ask and point people in the right direction. So thank you, Cam Smith from, from the, uh, the offices in, what are you in? You're in uh, Bushnell's basin over in the, the beautiful Bushnell's basin. Yeah. Just up the road from me, Mall. Yeah. A hop, so. skip, and a jump from Lollipop Farm. All right. Absolutely. Thank you, Cam. Appreciate you jumping on, buddy. And uh, stay well. No problem, man. We'll catch up with you later. All right. Keep feeding them. See ya.